Hereby, I open this academic ceremony in which Mr. Kolja Schneck will defend the academic thesis, skill dispersion, firm specialization, and wage inequality. May I invite you to present us a short summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis. The floor is yours. Let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Dear Prorector, dear members of the Corona, dear family, friends, and audience. In the coming 15 minutes, I will shortly give you an overview over my research and present you the main findings of my thesis titled Skill Dispersion, Firm Specialization, and Wage Inequality. Many of the inventions of the last 200 years were developed to replace human labor. The steam engine was developed to replace mechanical power for human physical toil. First factory systems were developed to replace inconsistent handiwork with machine perfection. Later came electrification and the assembly line. Then fast forward till today, you can see more robots on the shop floor than humans. Did you know that a computer was actually an occupational title at least until the middle of the 1950s and referred to a person that does computations? What are all these people doing? In 1980, less than 10% of the production cost of a car was caused by electronic parts. In 2015, it was more than 30%, and in 2030, it's an estimated 50%. These new electronic parts and applica applications require new skills and have created a lot of jobs. For example, the cognitive systems engineer who optimizes the interaction between the driver and the electronic system. In, no, in 1980, no one had the slightest idea that such a job would exist. The key question is not if technology replaces jobs, but when, how fast, to what extent, and with, with which consequence, consequences. And this is the context in which this thesis is embedded in. On this basis, I ask three questions. The overreaching theme that connects these questions are the effects of techn technological change on the labor market, the way firms organize their production, and the allocation of wages. So can we identify and measure periods of intense automation? Um, how do these new technologies change the way firms organize their production? And how did wage inequality develop in the most recent two decades? In order to answer these questions, I use a unique, unique data set based on matched employer-employee data from the Netherlands. These data contain information on the characteristics of workers and firms. For example, on the firm level, I have information on the type of assets a firm has, the production value or factor cost. I also have detailed information on the worker level, for example, age, gender, wage, employment and unemployment spells, and partly education for basically all workers in the Netherlands. In my first chapter, I examine the effects of intense automation on the composition of firms. For instance, what happens to the organization if it uses novel technologies such as machine learning or artificial intelligence that is embedded, for example, in automated warehouse systems or robotic process automation? Plainly speaking, do firms automate away low-skilled jobs and hire more high-skilled employees? What happens to the distribution of wages inside a firm? Are wages after automation periods more unequally distributed? And is there a difference in the effects of different types of investments? So for example, do IT spikes, investment spikes carry different implications than investment in automation capital or machine capital? Generally, firm level investments tend to be lumpy. Um, this can be seen on the figure on the left. That means that for some time, not much happens, then a lot happens in terms of investment activity. And then for some time, not much happens again. Although I use a slightly different method, the simplest way to identify investment spikes is to take the maximum investment in a given period. This single year already accounts for on average about 20 to 30% of all investments in that given period. Afterwards, in an event study, I look at what happens prior to and subsequent to these spikes to different firm level metrics that I infer from the data of the workers these firms employ. What happens in and around investment spikes can be, can be seen on the figure on the right. Uh, the introduction of new vintages of technology is associated with changes in the labor composition of firms and firms respond to various investment spikes in different ways. Generally, firms grow 
and higher a larger share of high skilled employees. To be more precise, firms that spike have a workforce that is on average 5% larger. Given a mean firm size of 110 employees, this translates to an increase of six workers. The average workforce age decreases by about 0.15 years. And this is all in comparison to firms that do not spike. I also examine compositional effects on wages and wage dispersion inside a firm. However, here my results are less clear. Although I observe some effects for spikes in automation capital, these are associated with a permanent increase in wages by about 0.75%. I do not find these effects for other types in, of investment in, for example, IT or in machines. Finally, with regards to the composition of skills in a firm, my findings indicate that the share of high-skilled individuals increases during the year of the spike, but only has persistent effects for IT spikes. For automation equipment, I find a decrease in the share of low-skilled workers, which could indicate the substitution of low-skilled workers by these technologies. In the second chapter of my thesis, I examine how the distribution of skills in a firm is related to its productivity. The factors that drive firm productivity have been uh, the subject of a good deal of research over the past few decades. We know about persistent and substantial differences in productivity between firms, but also the connection between productivity and observable characteristics, for example, size, technology, innovation activity, and so forth. However, only little is known about how firm outcomes are related to the characteristics of the workers these firms employ. The role of skill distribution in determining a firm's production performance is related to the nature of the firm's production function and depends on the degree of complementarity or substitutability of skills. This sounds complicated, um, and I think it's good to give an example here. In some industries, such as aerospace or engine manufacturing, production requires completing a long sequence of tasks and poor performance at a single stage greatly reduces the overall value of output. Other activities, for example, in warehousing, depend heavily on the performance of a few workers, which result in a dispersed skill distribution of the workforce. This is exemplified by the two pictures on the bottom left. Uh, the left one shows you a SpaceX assembly line. One mistake during production and the rocket may explode during or after the liftoff. But if someone messes up your Amazon order, this may be an annoyance to you, but probably won't change the fact that you will order again from Amazon. The right picture actually shows you a state-of-the-art Amazon warehouse. So the question is, did technology modify the optimal skill mix of the recent past? And did production shift from a mode where firms employ workers of different skill levels to one in which some firms mainly use high-skilled workers, that would be SpaceX, and others which rely mainly on low low skilled workers, this would be Amazon warehouse. So what did I find out? First, in terms of the wages they pay, firms have become more different over time. The two top figures show the wage segregation index for manufacturing and service firms. I'm going to spare you the details, but the way you can interpret these figures is that the workforce within firms becomes more similar, while firms themselves have become more different. Second, the distribution of skills matters for productivity. Generally, firms that operate with production technologies that are characterized by lower levels of dispersion are more productive. In manufacturing, not shown here, one can observe a clear trend. The most productive firms, both in high and low tech, also have the highest skilled workforce. Interestingly, you can observe the opposite pattern for knowledge intensive services. These do not have the highest skilled labor force, Instead, this seems to look like the Amazon warehouse case where firms mainly rely on low-skilled labor and few high-skilled managers and professionals. The last chapter is on the development and explanations of the development of wage inequality in the Netherlands. Generally, wage inequality can increase because wages within firms are more dispersed or because some firms, firms pay better wages. Wage inequality has increased in most industrial economies since the 1970s. The Netherlands has long been considered an exception to this trend because wage inequality has remained relatively stable, particularly at the highest levels of the wage distribution. However, as you can see on the figure on the left, this has also changed. It shows you the development of wages uh, 
for the 80s, the 50s, and the 20th percentile of full-time male employees. What it shows is that between 2001 and 2016, wage inequality between the top 80s and the bottom 20th percentile increased by about four percentage points. Several explanations have been proposed for this increase in wage inequality. For example, that changes in the demand and supply of skills are related to skill biased technological change. And some more recent studies have shown that, similar to the graph that I showed on the last slide, that um, differences in average wages, differences in the average wages that firms pay play an important role in explaining overall wage inequality. For instance, high wage workers became more likely not only to work for high wage firms, which we economists describe as sorting, but also became more likely to work with other high wage workers, which we describe as segregation. So in this chapter of my thesis, I analyzed the role of worker composition of firm and worker composition in the development of wage inequality in the Netherlands. And my main finding is that differences in the average wages that firms are paying are responsible for nearly the entire increase in wage inequality. I also find strong evidence of increases in sorting that high wage workers work for high wage firms and strong increases in segregation that high wage workers tend to work with other high wage workers. What explains the higher between firm inequality? Although I only present descriptive evidence here, I believe that it's quite illustrative. One explanation could be that the most productive firms tend to hire primarily the best educated individuals. This is exemplified by the figure on the right. Here I rank firms um, based on their average wages and then look at changes in the distribution of workers by their educational degree between 2001 and 2016. You can see that the share of workers with low and medium levels of education disproportionately increased in low wage firms and decreased in high wage firms. And the share of workers with high levels of education decreased in low wage firms and increased in high wage firms. The increase in, demand for, in the demand for skills is particularly pronounced among the STEM fields. So science, technology, engineering, and medicine. And you can see a similar picture as compared to the educational level. Um, so for instance, the share of workers with a degree in mathematics or physics increased by about 2.5 percentage points in the highest paying firms between 2001 and 2016. So to conclude, the three chapters of my dissertation are centered around the topics of skill dispersion, firm specialization, and wage inequality that result from technological and organizational changes at the firm level. In my first chapter, I analyze the relationship between investment spikes and labor adjustments of firms. I investigated three types of investment, investment in machines, in IT, and in automation. My firm level findings indicate that Investment spikes represent significant disruptions to a firm due to which they expand, but also change their labor input. In the second, in the second chapter, I study the relationship between the distribution of skills and productivity and analyze whether the effects of skill level and skill dispersion vary at different points of the productivity distribution. In the third chapter, I analyze changes in the wage distribution of the Netherlands and find that wage inequality increased mainly driven by differences in the average wages that firms pay. And I wanna close my presentation by giving a brief look into the future. The question is, should we worry about automation? The economist says, there is nothing to worry about, an extraordinary job boom is underway. David Order, a well-known economist who did a lot of research on this topic and his team at MIT say, we should worry. Technological progress will deliver increases in productivity, but it's not clear whether these gains will benefit everyone. And I tend to support Professor Arthur's argument. The type of jobs that are well paid and demanded in the future are very likely to require fundamentally different skills than the jobs that will be automated, which you can see right now in the US. But given that in the coming years, many baby boomers will retire, I think there is no other option rather than to embrace automation, but also the necessity to better think about how people who have been displaced by automation can be supported, trained, and reintegrated into the labor market. Um, but also uh, 
to think about how we can change education because we basically still use the same educational system that was invented at the beginning of the industrial revolution and prepare people better for the labor market of the future. Nevertheless, I'm optimistic because we are living in an exponential age. We are in the midst of a radical societal change that is driven by a series of exponential technologies, which will transform the way we live, but also how we interact with each other and the world around us. As these technologies mature, so for instance, artificial intelligence, synthetic biology or renewable energies, they will challenge, our, they will challenge and change our social and economic fabric. And with these words, I want to end my presentation and thank you for your attention. I now give the word back to the prorector. Mr. Schneck, <clears throat> thank you uh, for your presentation. The uh, opposition will be opened by Professor Didier Fouarge, who was the chair of the assessment committee and who is a professor in labor economics. The floor is to Professor Fouarge. The dear candidate, uh, let me first congratulate you on the thesis. In, uh, I think you demonstrate in that thesis your abilities at academic research on the topic that I like, skills use, production in firms, and how that affects inequalities. So I, I, I really appreciate the aptitude that you display in, in conducting in-depth empirical analysis and uh, using uh, large administrative matched employer, employee data. And, and I guess it took you uh, uh, quite a bit of an effort to construct that data. But today, I would like to further challenge some of the analyses that you report, in particular those in chapter three. In that chapter, you investigate the impact of skill levels and skill dispersion on, on the firm's value uh, added. And it strikes me that you take a view on skills that is rather short-sighted in many ways. And I would like to reflect on, on these choices uh, that you have made in that chapter. And I raise three points. The first, um, skills in the setting of chapter three are unidimensional. They are measured in wage and they range from low to high. So I understand that you are facing data challenges, data constraints when using administrative data from Statistics Netherlands. But still, even at Statistics Netherlands, there are sources of data that potentially could help you say more about the production function in firms and the skill structure uh, in firms. For example, by investigating the occupational structure um, uh, of, uh, of firms using data from uh, the labor force survey that you could match to the admin data. So that's the first point. The second is um, individual skills in the setting of chapter three are viewed as fixed and stable over time. So this is because of the estimation strategy that you, uh, that you explain in equation 3.1, in which you use a panel fixed effects model um, to, uh, to, 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 to estimate your, your, um, your, your to, to perform estimations on, on your data. So that model assumes that individuals do not learn new skills and that they also do not lose new skills, for example, uh, when new technologies are, are, are introduced in the firms and, and their skills will become obsolete. So the, this approach, um, uh, I mean, strikes me because it's not, it does not really square with the overall topic of the, of the dissertation. And I think our approach could have allowed you to include that uh, individual learning and uh, 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 loss of skills uh, in, your, in your analysis. For example, uh, Pischke has a nice uh, model in the Journal of Population Economics that allows for uh, time, uh, time individual uh, uh, trends. The third point, um, uh, it's about the, um, uh, uh, the combination of how skills affect uh, uh, firm productivity within, within firms. So, your chapter discusses the heterogeneity of skills in firms. So, a, 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 but a worker's wage in a firm will depend on the added value of that worker in the same firm. So, you have controls for a firm fixed effects in your estimation for the permanent wage and skills. But I saw little discussion on the endogenous relation between labor skill input on the one hand and the value added in firms on the other hand. So these are the three points that I would like to reflect on. 
The first was on a unidimensional uh, view of skills that you take in chat that chapter. The second point was on the stability of skills. And the third point is on the endogenous relation between skills and value added in firms. Dear highly esteemed opponent, um, thank you for your kind words and also thank you for your questions. Um, you raised three um, very important points here, I think. Um, uh, it is in fact the case that my measure of skills is uh, unidimensional and only ranges from low to high. Um, this is obviously um, a, an artifact of the, the type of data that I use. Um, I'm not aware what other um, yeah, skill measures there are to use uh, with, with wage data. Uh, and I do agree with you that uh, there are also other sources of data. Um, so in the beginning, I was in the beginning of the project, um, I was actually looking at uh, my main my main focus was actually on tasks because I, I was more interested in uh, what are the specific tasks and or skills, um, but skills in a broader type of sense. So, for example, social skills or analytical skills, uh, but their data avail availability um, was uh, actually pretty poor. Um, I had wonderful data on uh, a lot of um, dimensions at the firm level, um, productivity, uh, um, 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 productivity and investment um, information. And I also had wonderful information at the firm, uh, at the worker level. So I have information on age, uh, education only partly. Um, wages, employment and unemployment spells. And I think this, this allows to create for a wonderful um, matched employee, employer employee data set that um, contains the, basically the population of workers in the Netherlands. Uh, one crucial shortcoming of this data set is that it only allows to match this, this data uh, to a uh, fraction of the workers um, that are also available in the occupational uh, or the, the labor, first, labor force survey that you were mentioning. Um, I, did have this information later on, um, but I did not take it into account in the beginning uh, because there then I settled basically um, on the the uh, the measurement of skills that I use here. Uh, I, I do agree that uh, this is not the let's say uh, state of the art method to use um, or to measure skills, um, but the the main motivation behind this was um, basically to have also comparability because many other highly cited papers uh, in, in the past um, used this measure of skills uh, to create uh, measures such as the um, segregation index. Um, yes, so th this, this is that point. Um, then, one point that you that you also raised was uh, that individual skills and fixed effects are stable over time, and that my measure does not allow to um, yeah basically include individual learning or basically the losing of skills over time. And I also agree with you uh, that my measure is not able to capture this, uh, and this is def definitely a shortcoming of my thesis. Uh, however. Um, I believe, or I wasn't really aware that there are any other measures that, that are based on, on wages that allow uh, to take um, individual learning uh, or losing of skills into account. Um, it, it may be problematic, um, but what, what it basically does is it, it um, because in, in, the, uh, in the wage regression, um, I control for age uh, and the worker fixed effects and basically consists of uh, a lot of things. So for example, um, gender, education and occupation and all of this is mixed into this sort of skill measure that I use. Um, yes, it does not change over time, uh, but in order to circumvent this problem, uh, there is also the um, the option, for example, that you um, estimate the model over two different periods of time. 
so if you estimate the model over two different periods of time, then you also get different fixed effects for, for workers. So this partly allows you to um, control for this learning and losing of skills, because then the these this worker fixed effect component can either increase or decrease depending on the wage that a that a uh, worker earns. So if a worker loses his skill and then uh, ends up with a lower level of wage or uh, just a um, a relatively stable uh, level of wage, then this is also captured by uh, this this two level fixed effects uh, regression that I'm using. Um, the other case would also be true. So if this worker would gain new skills and would, uh, for example, um, work in an occupation where this new skill is required, so for example, a new programming type of skill and his, his wage would rise, then my measure would also capture this. Um, your third point was on the heterogeneity of skills in firms. Um, and um, sorry for... Uh, asking a clarifying question, but could you just maybe elaborate a bit on this again? Because I wasn't really sure if I captured this all correctly. Yeah, sure, let me let me briefly uh, uh, explain my point. So um, within firms, uh, workers' productivity, workers' wages uh, will depend on the uh, production technology in, the, in those firms. So uh, when there is a complementarity between uh, worker skills and the type of technology that is um, used in a firm, you would expect wages of that individual, that person to, uh, to, 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 to grow because of these complementarities and, and otherwise decline when there is a, a substitution uh, between the technology and the worker skills. Uh, and, and you know they sort of relate to the to the to the to the previous point as well. Uh, 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 you know uh, uh, about the you know the in potential inclusion of individual specific uh, effects to capture these uh, dynamic complementarities of this endogenous selection. So uh, so it, it so uh, did I, did, I, did I make my point clear? Um, only only partly. <laughs> Only partly. So, so I would like you, just to, for you to, to reflect on how this complementarity between the worker skills and the, and the firm production process, how, how is that captured in your analysis? Is it captured, yes or no? And, and how do you think it is captured? Please do um, speak only because I would also like to give the others an opportunity to talk with you. Okay. Um, sorry. Um, dear highly esteemed opponent, um, Thank you for the clarification. Um, so you ask how within firm production technology is related to the potential inclusion of, of um, skills. Um, well, first of all, they, I mean, they, it's not really possible to, to um, account for, for example, the sorting of workers into certain firms. Um, so, um, I am not sure whether I understood still your, your point correctly, uh, but I don't think that I can... The uh, prorector allows, I think one of the questions to be coming will be dealing with a slight, this question in a slightly different way and you will get the chance to explain that. Okay, okay. Um, anyways, what I, wanted to, what I wanted to say is that uh, I cannot really control for the endogenous relationship between um, labor input and value added, no. Okay, thank you for the time being. The uh, opposition uh, should be continued by Professor Salomon. Regretfully, uh, uh, she can't be present. And if time allows, um, her question uh, will be dealt with later on at the end of the first round. The floor now goes to uh, Dr. Sabien Dobelare, who was a member of the assessment committee and who is an associate professor in applied microeconometrics and economics at the Free University of Amsterdam. The floor is to Dr. Dobelare. Thank you. Dear candidate, let me start by applauding you in your thesis. So your thesis consists of three substantial chapters. It's a coherent piece of work of high academic standards. And I particularly value that you use like a range of empirical methods and to make optimal use of available CBS micro data sources to examine the interplay between firm specialization, productivity, labor composition, and wage inequality in the Netherlands. So each chapter on its own contributes to the field and I expect them to publish well. 
But today I am here to challenge you. So let me do that. Um, and I, I would like to challenge you on the uh, modeling approach that you use in chapters two and three, which is the about Kramar's uh, Margolis modeling approach. So in chapter two, you measure a worker skill as we learned. Uh, from, the, from the previous question as the individual effect from estimating this relatively separable model. And then chapter three, use the same statistical uh, model to quantify the contributions of workers and firms to wage inequality. So my first question relates to the key identifying assumption of the AKM model. And the second question relates, let's say, give taking the AKM model as given, it relates to the estimation of the AKM model. So um, let me first turn to the uh, conditional exogeneity, uh, conditional exogenous mobility assumption, so the key identifying assumption. So basically it means that, well, the assignment of workers to firms is random, conditional on the observable characteristics of workers and firms. And I find this a very strong assumption, which is basically at odds with many well-known models of labor markets with frictions. So um, in table 4.2 on page 85, and also in the appendix, you present a test for the validity of this key uh, assumption for identification. But I'm not very convinced by the test presented in table 4.2. So my concern is that endogenous mobility is a potential threat to your identification strategy. And the reason why I'm concerned is that the job matching model has clearly a better fit than the AKM model. And the improvement in fit is, I would say, rather large, given that the standard deviation of the match effect implied by the improvement of fit is in the range of 0.4 T which is uh, more than seven times larger as in the original card hiding climate paper and also in other, uh, in other recent work. So my first question to you is, uh, can you convince me that my worry is unjustified? That's one question. And the second question is, imagine that my worry is justified. Can you comment on the direction of possible biases in your estimates of the additively separable model? So that was the first question about the key identifying assumption. Thank you. Second question on the AKM model is about the estimation. And let's say that we accept the key identifying assumption that it's valid. You know, recent work has a kind of a proposed um, bias corrections to solve the limited mobility bias inherent in the estimation method in the AKM modeling approach. So um, I have two little questions. The first is, can you convince me that limited mobility bias is not a concern in your empirical setting? And second, imagine it was. Can you again comment on how such biases might alter your results uh, about alter your conclusions about uh, labor markets and wage inequality in the Netherlands. Yes. Um, dear esteemed opponent, uh, thank you for your questions and thank you for your kind words. Um, just to make sure that I understand your questions correctly. So the first question was on the key identifying assumptions and you basically criticized um, my uh, assumption of uh, it, the endogenous uh, mobility and that uh, basically the mobility uh, um, results from random um, random assignment of workers to firms uh, that is at odds with the current literature. And you refer to table 4.2, um, which I'm not too familiar with. So I have to look which, uh, to, uh, which table you mean. It's a table where you compare like the AKM model to the, uh, to the match. Ah, model yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, 
Yes, and then uh, so then you, you then you ask whether uh, the endogenous um, whether there is an endogenous mobility trap, if, you, if I understood you correctly, and whether this uh, poses a concern uh, because job matching models are better. Uh, or, or, yeah, the job matching model uh, is a better fit uh, because it is the the R square improves by a factor of. 40, if I understood you correctly. Yes. Um, well, uh, yes, it uh, it may be a concern, uh, but, but to be honest, I would need to think more about this. Um, and this uh, may be something uh, that we could discuss in uh, more detail uh, after the session. Uh, Although I do believe that um, the tests that that I did uh, in order to test for this uh, endogenous mobility are sufficient, uh, because if you look at wage profiles um, of of workers that uh, change between low and high wage firms, so for example that are in the um, lower quarter or upper quarter of of firm average wages, uh, that you don't see um, well, you, you see changes, but the wage profile uh, is relatively stable prior to this, this um, job change. So, um, and you see, the, you see the same pattern in between changing changes of um, uh, workers between um, firms that are in the middle of the wage distribution. So, uh, I don't think that there are any other issues, although I do agree, as I stated also earlier, that this, this is not really the state of the art model anymore. Uh, and yes, there is a lot of criticism, uh, especially on the assumptions uh, of this model. And uh, the job matching model um, may indeed uh, give a better fit, um, but uh, I, to be honest, I did not look at the increase in R square in terms of the percentage and overall factor that this would, um, which which would um, increase the uh, yeah the percentage of variance that is explained by my model. Um, Thank, you so far. Thank you so far, Mr. Schnecke, because I would like to give the other three members of the opposition also an opportunity to uh, uh, bring forward some issues. So. so um, and then you refer to a discussion afterwards uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Dobelara anyway. So the floor now goes to uh, Professor René Belderbos, uh, who is a professor in international corporate strategy and uh, from both Leuven and here at Maastricht University. The floor goes to Professor Belderbos. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, dear candidate, uh, dear Kolja, um, I read your dissertation with interest. It, uh, bundle three nice essays on investments, uh, employment and, and wages and skills. And I think the discussion on the wage dispersion on the wage inequality in the Netherlands is, is quite topical uh, and provides new insights. Personally, I liked most actually the insights on the skill complementarity versus the skill substitutability, because I saw some kind of parallel with uh, the innovation literature where we uh, distinct, uh, make a distinction between complex and discrete technologies. I think for future research, that might be an interesting parallel to investigate. Um, my question also relates to technology and innovation, and in particular, the way it's conceptualized and measured or not measured in your dissertation. Um, so you frame uh, your chapters and motivation of your chapters as uh, research questions on the impact of technological change. Um, and you state in various places that that is actually uh, the key issue in your dissertation, uh, for instance, on page 98. And uh, it features quite um, broadly in the impact paragraph as well. Um, but to an innovation scholar, uh, if I consider myself as such, um, this is a bit of a bold statement because in your dissertation, uh, you don't use any innovation or uh, theories, um, but also you don't measure anything uh, related to R&D, innovation, uh, or patents, uh, or technology, or technology classes uh, and technologies firms are active in. 
Um, and if I then refer to the uh, chapter two on, on investments, uh, you look at investment spikes and you consider that uh, you consider that these investments spikes uh, embed new technologies and then lead to all kinds of effect on, on skills and employment. Uh, but actually, we don't really know to what extent these investments uh, represent new technologies. For instance, it could be that an investment spike in machinery uh, is uh, uh, an investment spike by ASML and represents really a new product and process technology on semiconductor manufacturing in ultraviolet technologies. But it could also just be that uh, there's an investment spike uh, maybe by the retailer action in yet another of its warehouses without really new technologies and it's just expansion. Um, so I... If I look at your data, I see that these spikes are actually not more common in high-tech industries and are associated with employment growth. So I have the impression that actually quite a few of these investments are expansions rather than embedding new technologies. But frankly, we don't know. And what we do know is that there will be a lot of heterogeneity in the origins of these spikes. And, and that also, because of that heterogeneity, will have a lot of differences in the employment and skills uh, consequences of these investments. Um, so, but that's not really explored in the dissertation, uh, but I think there would be a lot of opportunities to, uh, to explore this because as we know, Statistics Netherlands has great data on community innovation surveys, on R&D surveys, and actually, it's quite easy to link uh, these, uh, the data on firms uh, to the investment statistics that you're using. And there's a lot of expertise actually in the department on innovation and innovation service. Um, so my questions are, wasn't this discussed, uh, the heterogeneity in these spikes? And maybe to get a bit more information on what type of investments we are dealing with, not, not only the distinction between automation, ICT and machinery, but also what maybe types of firms or if, if it's related to uh, innovative firms or not. Um, and if you could do this, so if you could do this in future research um, and you could make a distinction maybe between product and process innovations, then I would like to hear your views on what types of differences in the effects on skills and, and dispersion you would expect from product versus process innovations that are associated, uh, if they are associated with these uh, investment spikes. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, dear highly esteemed opponent for your kind words and your questions. Uh, so if I understand you correctly, you pose two questions. So the first question is, uh, wouldn't it have been possible to link further data on innovation um, on uh, to the investment uh, data that I have at the firm level? And the second question is, uh, what are the or what would I assume are different effects um, on in investment if uh, there were product or process innovations at the firm level? Is that correct? Yeah. Yes, and with okay. the considerations why this was not actually looked at because you emphasized yes. the technology aspect so much in the dissertation, yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, um, well, the, the problem is that uh, if you look at the community and innovation survey um, that you only, so basically the, 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 the way the survey is structured, it looks at the past three years. Um, so for example, if you, if you look at the, the year 2010, it looks at the years 2008, 2009, and 2010 and asks whether a firm had a process or product innovation in a particular year. year. Um, the first problem is that um, you only get cross-sectional data. So it's not really, uh, it, it doesn't really work if you wanna have a balanced panel uh, because um, if I'm not mistaken, the community innovation survey data is only available every two years. So 2008, 2010, 12, 14, 16, and so on. Um, and it, it only gives you, so you don't have the window. So you don't have the event window data here. Um, 
because you only have data at specific points in time. And whether someone is an innovator in 2006 doesn't necessarily mean that someone is an innovator uh, in 2007 and 2008. Um, so the, the first problem was actually the, the type of, uh, the, the length of the data that was available. And the second problem is that um, the CIS data is only available for a very limited amount of firms um, so I actually looked at whether I could merge um, or match the data to the existing data that I have, um, but it wasn't really possible because uh, then you only end up with like 100 observations uh, because the overlap is relatively small. So the main problem is uh, are not investment data per se, uh, but the main problem is uh, production data because production data is much less available than the investment data. Um, so that also relates to whether you use an unbalanced or balanced panel, uh, which also relates to whether you use actually a structural model or a reduced form estimation. Um, I chose to use a structural model and uh, a balanced panel, and this uh, gives you some constraints at the amount of data that you have at your disposal. Um, so in this sense, it, it's not really in the end, it's not really uh, doesn't really work out uh, to to look at this data on innovation. Although I do agree that it would have been interesting to have this information um, and to be able to differentiate between different types of innovators, um, because I think, um, and this is also now linked to your second question, um, what would I expect in uh, as with regards to the effect of uh, product and process innovation? Um, on the investment of um, firms. Um, I think at least with regards to the outcome, so uh, whether wages change or the wage distribution changes or firms hire different types of labor inputs, I think their process innovations probably have a much larger effect than product innovations. Uh, for product innovations, you may change the overall or some parts of your production technology, which now captures the your production floor and basically the machines or type of software that you have there. Um, but uh, process innovation is more, much more related to automation, I would say. Uh, I'm not an innovation scholar, uh, but I partly started out of this innovation literature. Uh, so this, this was uh, a focus in the beginning. Um, but to, to, to well, give you the answer, uh, I think it would more touch up on um, process innovation that are related to investment spikes and then outcomes uh, rather than product innovation. Thank you so far. Thank you so far. The opposition will be continued by Dr. Boas Lokshin, who was a member of the assessment committee and who's an associate professor in productivity, innovation and industrial organization. The floor is to Boris Lokshin. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, dear colleague, dear candidate, uh, also my congratulation on reaching this uh, milestone. And uh, also let me go back to uh, chapter two, uh, chapter one in your uh, today's overview. Specifically, I would like to hear your thoughts on, on the following. Um, so the identification of investment spikes, um, uh, as you described, relies on a structural spike model uh, that uses maximum likelihood. And this approach uh, draws on early adopted methods from 2007 paper. So my first question is to what extent this is still a state of the art methodology in identifying identification of investment spikes. I also note that spikes account for about 21, maybe 50% of total investments. That's something you report on page 22. And especially uh, for some types of investments, the probability of identifying a spike can be as low as 0.15 or 0.2, something you report on page 25 of your thesis. So first, how do these uh, probabilities and percentages compare to other accepted research on investment? And given that uh, these probabilities seem to be uh, rather low, uh, what does it uh, imply for identification strategy that you employ? Especially that you say on page 27, only a small number of firms appear to be spiking multiple times. Um, and you study sort of a 10 year period span uh, in your empirical model. So does an empirical approach incapable to identify all instances of substantial investments by firms, or alternatively, these investments are less lumpy than this chapter assumes? 
And so um, maybe these investments uh, are more spread out in time. And what implication does it have for the identification uh, specification that you propose in equation 2.7? Thank you. Thank you for your thoughts on this. Dear esteemed opponent, um, thank you for your questions. Um, so you're referring to the first chapter that I presented today on investment spikes and uh, ask whether the uh, approach that I'm using with uh, the structural model and uh, the maximum likelihood estimation of these equations are still considered state of the art. Um, so basically you ask three questions. This is the first question. The second question is whether, uh, so there are some uh, low probabilities for some types of investment and you ask whether, uh, so how these compare to other research and uh, if my uh, empirical approach is capable of identifying all of these investments correctly and if not, if investments are spread out more over time, uh, what are the implications of this for my model? Um, so let me answer your first question. Uh, I still believe that, uh, or I do believe that the uh, structural model is still considered state of the art. Um, generally a structural model um, allows for the interpretation or, or assumption testing uh, of specific parameters. And if you look at the investment literature, uh, then there is a long discussion on the type of the, the cost components of, of these investments. Um, so obviously having the structural model comes with additional assumptions. Um, if the model is misspecified, uh, then the identification of the parameters is not possible, uh, which leads to biased results. Um, but uh, it, it, it allows you to test whether, for example, uh, in a certain investment has a convex or non-convex cost component. Uh, and then this allows you to identify whether this, this investment is seen as an expansionary investment or simply as a replacement investment. Um, I do agree that this is more based on the investment literature and not so much on the effects of these investment spikes because they're well, basically uh, you want to know or you're interested in two different type of things here. So whether there are different cost components or simply let's just you know, use these investment spikes and then figure out what happens in and around these investment spikes. Um, I chose this, this approach. So I chose the, the structural approach because it basically allows me to test whether a specific, specific investment is expansionary or simply replacement. Um, and this requires me to use a balanced panel. Um, so, my results do not compare a, or there is no one-to-one -one comparison for my results with other papers, uh, especially two recent papers uh, by uh, Besson et al. and uh, by um, Treibig et al. Um, they use an ad hoc spike um, um, definition uh, where you basically assign, so that there are multiple ways to use this ad hoc spike method, but uh, one of the approaches is that you simply look at the maximum investment in a given period. Uh, and I do admire this approach because of its uh, simplicity, uh, because there you don't have to deal with the structural model and all the implications that the structural model poses. Uh, because the structural model, then the, one of the prerequisites is that you basically use a balanced panel, uh, because otherwise you would need to model firm entry and exit. Um, so back to your question. Um, do my probabilities compare to other research? And I would say, yes, uh, I do think that these other approaches also have similar spike probabilities. Um, and 
I do have to say that uh, at least for automation investment, I do find very low uh, spike probabilities. Uh, one thing that was striking to me is that uh, in a similar paper by Besson et al, uh, they were also looking at Dutch data and also at automation costs. But they use an unbalanced panel and also use just an ad hoc spike method. And uh, at least in the unbalanced panel, you can see a clear lumpiness uh, of these automation costs, which you don't see in a balance panel. This may be related to the way automation costs are measured. Um, so um, investments in IT and in machines are considered as investments, whereas automation costs are considered costs. So this information is from the production statistics, whereas the investment data is from the investment statistics. Um, Practically, so this is the theoretical difference. Practically, um, it is sometimes difficult to differentiate between the different types of investment because, um, for example, if you would lease equipment, this would be considered costs and not investment. Whereas if you pay, for example, the automation costs, um, these consider, just as a background info, um, these consider uh, typically sub subscription-based services for um Automation services, for example, um, robotic process automation, um, Amazon warehouse services, or uh, uh, process mining uh, applications. Um, Thank you so far. <laughs> Thank you so far. The, the, you referred uh, a few minutes ago to Treibich. I think it would be good having a Treibich uh, present in this opposition uh, to give the floor to... Uh, Dr. Tanja Treibich uh, for the last few minutes and um, to make sure that the discussion continues at the level that we're having it already. Uh, the floor goes to Dr. Treibich. Thank you, Prorector. Um, uh, so, of course, I'm, I'm very uh, aware of all this discussion about Chapter 2 and I would be very happy to discuss it further with um, uh, Kolya, but I think we have discussed a lot about the technical aspects of the different chapters uh, two and three. So I'd like instead to ask a more general question um, about linked to chapter four, so to the, the wage trends, and maybe trying to link a bit together uh, the different chapters. So uh, you do observe that we have um, uh, this increase in this wage inequality that is mostly, mostly due to differences between firms. So the average wage drives these differences. And I'd like you to explain a bit how this is related to your other results in the, in the thesis. So about uh, the, the wage effects of um, these different types of investments, as well as the link to productivity and skills. So do you have a sort of general story on uh, the sources of wage inequality and how they relate to investments and productivity changes in the Netherlands? Dear esteemed opponent, uh, thank you for your question. Uh, so you asked whether I can link the findings of chapter four to the, the observation of increases in wage inequality to the other uh, papers that I have. Um, let me think about this. Um, well, uh, yes, I think if, if you look at, if you look at, um, so it's not really the focus of my paper, but uh, what I find uh, very interesting was a recent paper by uh, Otter at I, where the, the, the superstar firms. Um, so basically you have an increasing concentration uh, of market, market shares within specific industries, uh, which is also linked to the firm premium that, um, that, fir that, that uh, firms pay. Um, so this is the, the between component. So uh, this was also um, was also related to a, um, an OECD paper. I think it was 2016, uh, titled "The Great the, the the Great Divergence" or "The Great." I'm, I'm not really sure about the the title, but it basically basically paints a similar picture of the superstar firms, namely that uh, there are some some superstar firms, and then there are the laggards. Um, and I think this also relates to strongly to wage inequality. Uh, so there is, I would say, a trade-off between having some very productive firms and uh, having wage inequality. So if, if you want to have superstar firms that compete and, and at an international stage, 
um, then these firms need to pay higher wages. Um, this is also linked to uh, market power, I would say, and that, um, well, in some cases, for example, Amazon, uh, there was no real uh, or, or um, yeah, that, that some firms have a too strong market power that um, enables um, or what disables. Um, uh, is that then a sorting effect or is it just that because they have higher productivity, then they there's rent sharing? Um, this may be both. I think they, 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 there is definitely the rent sharing component um, and there may also be the productivity component. Um, yes, um, generally, I think if, if you look at the Netherlands, uh, this effect is still um, a bit... Um, well, not as not as extreme as compared to other European countries, for example, the UK or the US, which may have to do with the um, Dutch labor system, so collective bargaining and universal coverage. Uh, so increases in inequality have been more, or have been less with regard or in comparison to other countries. Um, so in, in this regard, the Netherlands is uh, efficient at constraining this within uh, firm equality, uh, but between firm equality is, is present in the Netherlands and uh, increases over time. Um, yes, uh, I think that is my answer to this question. The beetle is muted, uh, but the beetle indeed said, Hora asked, the hour has passed. So Mr. Schneck, uh, the time appointed for defending your thesis has passed and the degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and the quality of your defense. And I request that you and your company uh, await the results of our deliberations and our return.
everyone's present again. Okay, Mr. Schneck, the degree committee here present online has assessed the quality of your thesis and the quality of your defense. And in view of its positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Pfann is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with that university custom. And I invite your supervisor to now take the floor. The floor goes to Professor Pfann. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ricoya, I first have to ask you a question on integrity. The question is as follows. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times? To be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? Yes, I promise. Thank you. By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present online, I hereby confer upon you, Kolja Schneck, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, you will be soon you will be soon receive the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary and the super, supervisor affixed with the official seal of the university shown by the beadle. Okay, well done. Thoughts. Applause. So, dear Kolja, dear Dr. Schneck, um, I would I would like to now give the floor to uh, to the to one of the other promoters, uh, Wilco Lettery, uh, for the laudatio. Thank you, uh, Gerard. Dear Kolja, let me first of all congratulate you, Eva, Anton, your family and friends with the academic degree you have obtained today. This moment of life is very special and typically occurs only once. Of course, it is a pity the event is not on campus as it would have been nice to see you and your beloved ones in person. The pandemic unfortunately made it necessary to plan the defense to happen online. And in the meanwhile, we are getting into a more relaxed regime when it comes to meeting in person but it was too late to allow for your defense to be organized in Maastricht. It takes a big effort and great perseverance to get to this stage, Kolja. I think actually perseverance is one of your key qualities. And let me try to elaborate on this and provide some evidence for that. The first piece of evidence starts with your seventh proposition belonging to the thesis. You quote Dwight Eisenhower by writing, plans are worthless, but planning is everything. I can imagine that also the writing of your thesis has made you select this statement as indeed getting to this stage is like a journey of which the final destination is a bit uncertain, but to get anywhere, preparation and planning are key and one has to persist. Second, and let me start by proposition eight, you write. It says, technological progress has merely provided us with more efficient means for going backwards. By quoting Aldous Huxley, you also believe this strongly, I think. I remember quite vividly that when I was still a head of department, I was very keen on having pictures of the colleagues on the departmental website to also make us more visible to the outside world on the internet. And many people nowadays are sharing almost whatever on social media, also back then. So it did not cross my mind that asking this would raise questions, but it did. You refused to provide a picture arguing that visuals could also be used for facial recognition. And back then, it was not so prevalent that this would be done, but now it is happening quite often, I'm aware. You were apparently quite ahead of your time then. Apparently you are still very critical about all of this and you are very keen to, pre to preserve your privacy. 
Yesterday, I tried to find a picture of you on the internet and I did not succeed. Also here, you persevere. Thirdly, as said before, writing a PhD thesis requires perseverance anyway. However, in your case, it has been tougher than what is considered normal. While you were working on your research, you encountered two crises. Maastricht University was hit by a cyber attack and almost immediately afterwards, the COVID-19 pandemic hit the world. Both crises have affected the normal way of working for all at Maastricht University, but also and especially for the PhD candidates. It is definitely not a small feat that you have shown such great resilience in coping with all of these big shocks in your life while writing your PhD thesis. Again, it requires persistence and perseverance. Fourth, you have also experienced very nice events in your personal life. You got married. You and Eva gave birth to a four kilo son in May. This is of course not a crisis, but still a big thing to happen in life. I also remember clearly myself becoming a parent. The joy is great, but it comes with feelings of responsibility and one also needs to learn new things, like changing diapers, bathing, taking temperature, etc. One also needs to adjust the rhythm of life because of nocturnal awakenings of the new family member. You have dealt with all of this, I guess. And also this I take as evidence of perseverance. I think I have provided sufficient evidence of one of your traits. Quot as demonstranden, we say, after proving a proposition. You persevere. Let me conclude by congratulating you one more time. Though it was nice to meet with you online today, I definitely hope to meet with you in person at some point in the future. It has, as it has been quite a long time ago that I saw you in three dimensions. It was a pleasure to be one of your supervisors, and I'm sure Gerard feels the same. I wish you all the best in your future career and a lot of happiness in your personal life. And as you are so perseverant, I'm sure you will succeed. And having said these words, I will give the words back to the Pro-Rector. Dear Dr. Snack, also on behalf of the Board of Deans, I congratulate you your family and your company and also uh, your supervisors uh, with the honor you have acquired and i would like to thank the members of the degree committee for their contribution today i hereby declare this ceremony to be ended <laughs>